All right, thank you to my subs uh, uh, viewer, YouTube viewer uh, Derek Swink uh, for giving me the idea for this video. He wanted to see the features from the Megalith Metropolis um, laid out uh, in map form. And actually this kind of exercise led me, uh, I started running calculations on the size of uh, this wall network on the size of uh, New England stone wall networks in total and on sizes of the boulders and the megaliths in and near these walls. So in this presentation you're going to see some some numbers that I think are pretty uh, revelatory uh, in terms of explaining um, really how big we're talking about both on the micro and macro level when it comes to New England stone walls and uh, why I keep using the word uh, megalith without an asterisk when I'm describing these features. We're gonna, so um, with that being said, what you're seeing here, um, the megalith metropolis um, is an area um, down an old class four road right down here. And the road, it's an out class four road is a, is a road that's not maintained by any municipality. The road runs 1.8 miles down here and it's bordered by these stone walls, which actually appear to go underwater at this pond. And on Google Earth, I, they reemerge on the other side of the pond. I only traveled down this road to the pond. But my next trip on uh, this Saturday, I'm actually going to walk around the pond and, and check out the walls on the other area. So <clears throat> basically, you know, local New Englanders are going to say the walls on either side of this were built when the Class 4 road was built as a result of the construction workers clearing rocks out of the way. And I think that's nonsense. I think that this was a very, very ancient road, possibly thousands of years old, and the walls have been here for that long as well. And I'm gonna show you why I think that. Um, so first, just to give some context here on the macro level, both on this um, megalith metropolis, and uh, I'm going to walk you through structures on either side of this area and within uh, the wall itself um, in a moment, but I do want to give context on really what 3.6 miles worth of stone walls means um, 1.8 miles in one direction. It's two you know, ro walls on either side, and I'll show you the weights of stuff in the walls, but also on the context of what uh, the quarter of a million miles in New England as a whole, what that really means um, in relative terms. So... The megalith metropolis, like I said, it's 3.6 million miles, uh, sorry, 3.6 miles of walls, and that is only the walls um, on either side of the path. It does not include the walls that branch off, and it, the, the walls branch off all over the place. So I'm being very conservative here. So I did some math. There's a, you can go to any granite company online and you can estimate the weight of granite. Um, using conservative estimates, in this 3.6 miles worth of walls, there is 15.5 million pounds of granite, or about 7,800 tons of granite. And to put that in perspective, that is just under three fully fueled Saturn V rockets. And the Saturn V rockets were massive rockets used to, to take uh, astronauts to the moon. So these are, this is just 3.6 miles worth of walls is equal to just under three Saturn V rockets. So that's huge. Uh, but the story gets even weirder. So let's talk about New England stone walls as a whole. There is an estimate, so the, the most common estimate that gets thrown out <clears throat> is that there are a quarter million miles worth of stone walls in New England. And this is based off of a 1930s estimation study by uh, a federal agency. And that estimate was based off of a late 1800s estimate. Um, so obviously this was done before satellite imagery. Um, so that's a very conservative estimate that there are a quarter million miles worth of stone walls of England. Now in perspective, using the granite calculator, just using a small size estimate of the walls, um, that's over a trillion pounds of stone or 550 million tons of stone, which equals to about 10 great walls of China the t uh, in terms of total stone weight. So the stone weight in New England stone walls is equal to that of 10 Great Walls of China. The Great Wall of China is, is a very massive structure when viewed close up. And the Great Wall of China, including the rebuilt section itself, is 13,000 miles long. Now that's stunning in terms of size, but what's really interesting is it for the Great Wall of China to be built 
Um, it took the builders over 2,000 years to build this structure. And the walls in New England <laughs> are 10 times larger in terms of weight. So that's why I keep saying I think these structures are thousands and thousands of years old because the magnitude is absolutely mind-blowing and people don't realize really the size of these walls. They see them everywhere. They think of them as colonial structures. They only see bits and pieces of them. Maybe half a percent of people know about this figure, but it took the builders of the Great Wall of China over 2,000 years to build that and in weight it's 10 times smaller than New England stone walls. So the, the New England stone walls as a whole are, are the one of the most significant ancient stone structures on earth and no one really knows that, that that's the case. All right, with that being said, <laughs> to, to, that really blew my mind when I did the math on those and it's, it's simple math. And if anybody has any questions, I'll show you how I came to those figures. It's really easy math. Um, I'm now gonna walk you through um, I'm going to walk you through Megalith Metropolis here. Um, I'll show you where I am at each point. Um, <clears throat> and I'm going to show you uh, the estimated weights of, of significant structures in here. And I'm going to show you common Native American structures that are nearby. Um, just to kind of back up the idea that this stuff is, is quite ancient and was important to the Native cultures in the area. Um, I started my hike uh, from the north side and the walls. Most walls in this area go north, south, or east, west. These were no different. It was quite a straight shot south. Um, I started, uh, the class four starts right up here. And uh, I started doing my photography right about, uh, oops, actually, let's move this camera a bit. Just a bit up, okay. So the photography starts up, up, up in this region. And uh, with that being said, let's hop right into the imagery from that hike. And this is just scratching the surface, really. So uh, the first significant piece I found that I was certain was megalithic was this section of wall. Notice this block right here. This is about 4,455 pounds. The average minivan weighs about exactly this much, about 4,500 pounds. So somebody placed a minivan sized boulder or in weight right here to form the base of this wall uh, these boulders are probably about seven or eight hundred pounds uh, this one's probably about seven or eight hundred pounds someone had to lift this up here and again this is this wall network is about just under three saturn V rockets in terms of weight so this is just a microcosm and already we've got ourselves a minivan moving south the wall does something funny. It become it actually is, is forms sort of a retaining wall in the forest. I see this rarely, but every once in a while you see this kind of retaining wall feature. Um, near just just near across the wall, you see a common native structure, which is these boulders with small rocks placed upon them. Usually it's one, two, or three, and if it's more, it's considered a native offering pile, often featuring quartz rocks. So this is a common native structure. Often I find these all over the woods very close to these walls. And I found well over 15 of these uh, in this hike. This is the highest concentration of stuff like this I've ever found uh, while, while doing this sort of study. Um, as I move south um, along, as I move south along the network, I'm, I'm, I'm a, uh, I hit this area right here. So these dots I just put here to represent the high number of native stone piles. There's a really strange, huge wall network, which I believe is actually serpent effigies right here. And right about here, uh, probably 15% of the way into the hike, um, we come to our first set of megaliths. And uh, you can see in my video, the megalith metropolis, I actually document um, this section of the hike. Um, I do believe this right here is a megalith, which would weigh in at about 26,000 pounds. Um, or about, let me do the math, what's 26,000 divided by 4,500? Um, two minivans would be 9,000. Four would be 18,000. Five, we're getting up to about six minivans worth of weight in granite right here. 
Uh, you can see the wall right here. It was very lucky I caught this because the brush is very heavy on this side, but just out of the corner of my eye I saw this. And this has a very flat face. So I found multiple structures um, um, of these ovals with very flat faces sitting on top of bedrock like this, which looks worked beneath the megalith. Um, and you, often they have these nice slices going through these uh, through them. So this is sort of a combination of features right here. And then we have two other what I believe to be megaliths uh, right here. Um, this one right here, viewed from the side, in my Facebook group, Jordan Kurtz New England Megaliths, K-E-R-T, um, I show a number of what I believe to be animal head megaliths. They have these right angled necks sloping faces, some are extremely triangular. So this is a shape I'm very familiar with. Uh, this right here weighs about 18,000 pounds, about four minivans, so a small one. And, it, and, and you can see the row of stones connecting to the other megalith behind it. So I do believe this is a, a, a megalithic effigy um, representing some kind of animal, probably a serpent. Natives worshiped uh, in New England, um, a serpent god called Uktana. Um, just uh, connecting to this, so this wall is running north-south along that uh, Class 4 road. The wall, out of sight, then branches to the east or west um, and has a very, very important uh, stone in it, which is this. Um, I believe this is a megalithic effigy representing a bird. I can back that up with archaeological research. Um, the book Bird Stones of North, the North American Indian um, and also Manitou features uh, two examples of stone bird. Um, <clears throat> these would be um, not effigies. I guess they would. Yeah, they're, they're small effigies, small representations of bird carved into stone. Um, this is a good parallel right here to what you're seeing here. The shape is quite quite similar very flat face this I think this thing had to have been carved a good question to ask is how are people carving granite like this so long ago probably thousands of years ago this would weigh about a thousand pounds so this is why I call this a megalithic effigy because it's a huge effigy um, it had to have been shaped therefore it's megalithic these uh, I would guess weigh probably 200 300 pounds each so this was a pretty pretty uh, heavy project for ancient peoples to be putting together. Now, in this area, um, this is a this this structure is part of a very, very small area that is absolutely packed with classic Native American structures. These these piles of rock sitting on large boulders. And it's actually this is this is part the wall connects these large boulders going back this way. There are two triangular shaped boulders sitting next to each other in this stone row. So this, this whole row is full of native structures. Um, you often find pieces of quartz in these. I did not in this one. Um, but uh, another example in the area is here. It actually has a standing stone right here, very precariously perched facing up with kind of a scoop taken out of it. Uh, so I think there's a lot of granite carving going on. And then another feature uh, you see in this wall network, the north-south going along the logging trail, is, is this hopping wall phenomenon. So I have found multiple examples. I think so far this year, I mean in the past two months really, I've found oh, at least a dozen examples of these walls where they run to a large boulder, this time more of a ledge, and restart up on the top, which I would find very strange for colonials to be doing this. Um, so I, I call them, anyway, I call them hopping walls. And within this 1.8 mile long wall network running south, you see multiple examples of the walls hopping down these these ledges. And I do think this ledge itself was, was uh, carved out. Uh, it's concave in here and there's a triangular boulder right near my knees, which I've seen other examples of. As you follow this hopping wall, remember this is all the same wall network. You find the wall connects to a huge boulder, and it's connected by this large boulder of quartz. And these large quartz boulders in these walls is something I find all over the place. They're really cool to find, but they're really unsurprising to me at this point because they're so common. Um, again, another reason, you know, I don't think we don't hear, see any mentions of col col colonists building stone walls with significant pieces of quartz. Quartz is very sacred to Native Americans more Native American stone structures. Uh, this one, I believe, had a piece of quartz right here, this white rock. 
and another one mostly buried back to megaliths in that wall network uh, we see a large oval with a flat face that would weigh in at about 70,000 pounds. It's actually perched over a cavity. The cavity is filled with small rocks. This is another common feature. Here's the wall leading to that perched oval. So if you're just walking across through the woods hunting um, and you haven't looked at this region looking specifically for these things, you're just going to think wall, big rock, no big deal. But if you've been doing this as long as I have, you're going to see this and, and know that something is up. Um, back here along the wall network, you see another big boulder of quartz, super common. And nearby, again, you see these piles, sometimes one, two, or three rocks on top of them. I'm pointing to another one off in the distance, so I'm pointing to two here, very close by. Yet another. The wall does something very interesting. So again, in the in our walk, we're now we're now in this confusing area. Um, I mapped this on Google Earth, just tracing walls that I could see, and I'm not sure exactly where this next picture is in here, but I know it's it's quite close. The wall does something I've never seen before. Um, it has this choke point. So we see the wall on this side make a right angle turn, which is very common for them to make right angle turns. This one kind of makes more of a curve and then shoots out uh, so it ends up being perpendicular to this side so these two open up to this very wide forest area it doesn't look like it actually encloses it um, so this choke point I found very interesting I don't really know why that would have been done but I you know my my, my explanation for a lot of these things I think they're ceremonial religious uh, structures representing something so I don't I, I don't think this has had any sort of like agricultural purpose an interesting feature in this wall just out of sight these two square tab, uh, blocks of rock sitting on top of each other the shapes matching up very very precisely um, colonial stonework uh, when they were uh, splitting granite you see grooves in the rock called the plug and feather method I should have included an example but you, you probably know what I'm talking about if you live in New England there'd be grooves here where they split the granite this is clearly two blocks of shaped granite but there's no plug and feather here and obviously um, old stone ancient peoples didn't have granite tip saws so the big question again is how how is this being shaped same wall network um, draw your attention to this stone right here this would weigh about 3,000 pounds it has a very flat face the wall here is one boulder thick all the way through. That's very common for these megalithic walls. They're almost always, I can't actually think of any, uh, there are certain sections where there's more piling, but the ones I'm interested in all tend to be one boulder thick. Uh, this shape right here, um, people interested in this subject would likely call this a Manitou stone. This is more of a boulder, it's 3,000 pounds. It's about three quarters the weight of a minivan. Um, and uh, Manitou represents uh, the Great Spirit. This is the head and these are the shoulders, and that's a very common shape in Native American um, stone structures. Oops, where did we go? Uh, this, this wall network becomes very small, it branches out. This would be known as a serpent row. This, is, this would be the head of the serpent right here. You can see off in the distance, that's the very tall wall I was just standing next to. And uh, again, another instance of just two stones on a boulder common native structure another piece of quartz in that wall and then this is from my second leg of the hike um, things got really interesting here I followed the wall network found more classic native piles and then found something extremely significant so if you're interested in the subject you know about megalithic stone chambers in New England uh, no one really knows who built them but they're they're kind of like they're spoken about um, they're surveyed, they're discussed in Manitou. Uh, in Manitou, which is a very legitimate uh, archaeological study, which includes these structures, uh, the authors, Maver and Dix, do refer to the roof lentils, these big things form of the roof, and openings over the door. They do refer to them as megalithic, so I'm not the first person to, to, to make that uh, analysis. This lentil right here, this big tablet over the entranceway would weigh about 2,600 pounds, um, a little more than half a minivan. Um, and what's interesting here, so this, again, this is built into that. Um, actually, let me show you. Let me catch you up here in the in the in the map. So now we're about here. 
Uh, actually, we're about here. Um, so again, walls running north-south, right? So this, uh, this chamber, which only goes back about seven or eight feet, it does end, it doesn't go all the way through. It's not a culvert. It, doesn't, it wasn't made for water to flow through. It's closed off at the very end, as is on the other side. There's another chamber on the other side. This one faces, uh, one, one side faces east, one faces west, and it's built into this wall. And as you travel across the road between the wall, you can see that the road at this section is actually made of these large lentils. And there's probably four of them uh, going backwards across to the other chamber. Uh, so uh, four times two, 8,000. Um, <clears> so there's about 12,000 pounds of, of these lentils forming this double-sided chamber, which is built into a wall. Another example of a chamber built into a wall would be the Upton Chamber in Upton, Mass. Um, so again, just the roof section of this section, <laughs> 12,000 pounds, a little under three minivans worth of megaliths. The other side, the westward, I believe, facing chamber, um, much more buried, uh, but it, I could, you know, poked my head in here, shown my light through. Doesn't go all the way through. I definitely don't think this was a culvert. I do think this was a megalithic chamber, and it's probably allied to some sort of astronomical event. Further down the wall network, we find another remarkable piece. Um, what I believe to be a, a megalithic serpent effigy. This would be its head, weighing in at about 3,300 pounds, um, about three quarters of a minivan. Uh, a good example of a serpent. Uh, well, it's a serpent mound. In Ohio, there's a very famous serpentine earthen mound, which is fully acknowledged by the archaeological community uh, to be an ancient structure. Um, so technically an ancient Native American structure. Uh, and it's very common in this community to, to assign uh, these walls to be serpent effigies. And I think just visually this looks very serpent-like with this being the head. Um, this, this stone right here, this big triangle, would weigh in at about 3,300 pounds, too. So, again, I, I don't think farmers clearing their fields, I don't think anyone could really visualize a horse dragging something like this. So, then it would be a then <laughs> the next culprit would be ancient peoples. So, then the big question now is how are ancient peoples moving stones like this, which is the same problem we face when we're analyzing something like Stonehenge. So, all the questions I'm asking here are not new or novel questions, they're new and novel for New England. Um, but when you look at megalithic structures like the ancient pyramids of Giza and uh, the Egyptian pyramids of Giza and Stonehenge, you have the same problems and questions. Um, like how are ancient people moving stuff like this? Here's a close-up of that triangle. Um, the boulders faces on this side are very flat and the back they're rounded. It looks like whoever built this paid more attention to making this side look look nice and even. Further along the wall, we have this big this big boy right here. I find a lot of uh, pieces of boulder, megalithic pieces often, balanced on two small stones in these walls. But this big uh, disc right here would weigh in about 5,700 pounds. Um, a, a, a very, very big minivan right there. The walls in this area often contain these big tablets. This one would be about 1,700 pounds. Can you picture people hoisting this up? I don't know if you could fit enough people around something like this to lift this. And uh, the next few slides are just going to be interesting sections of wall. Um, the tablets I find really interesting. Just I don't think anyone's finding tablets like this laying around the forest floor or farmer's fields. I think these had to be carved. Big tablet on the bottom right there. This is a nice sectional wall. You see this uh, declining side. You see this big tablet and smaller and smaller going all the way up this stack. The tablet is balanced on two rocks, cavity underneath. A tablet here, a tablet here. You can see the design and the symmetry right here. So this 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 section right here looks very very designed to me. Another big tablet. <clears throat> Another serpentine section. This being the head. 
Um, the walls, as I showed you before, contain tons of quartz. This is a really cool piece of quartz, a really reddish piece that was tucked into a section. Big reason why I don't tell anybody where these are is that I think these pieces are going to disappear as soon as people see them. Another hopping section in the same wall. And now in our hike, we are we're getting we're getting close to the pond, so we're probably we're probably about here right now. This was a really interesting piece. Look closely, they built a gap in the wall. The tree's kind of disguising it, but they built a really nice uh, recess recess in the wall. This piece is interesting because it's a nearly perfect cube. A nearly perfect cube of granite. I do not think this was found. I don't think this would occur naturally with granite being this perfect a cube and it's sitting on a, on a piece of rock that looks deeply buried. As we move, travel along we see more of these uh, offering piles, typical Native American structures. More offering piles. These are just off the wall, offering piles and pointing to another one in the distance. You can see this one close up. Another one, I've never seen so many so tightly packed together. And now one of my favorite finds of this trip, an 18,000 pound boulder sitting in this wall. And I see so many other examples of these huge structures, these huge stones on the walls having this notch or many notches in the bottom right. So these notches are very interesting. I, would, I call this early polygonal masonry. You see polygonal masonry all over megalithic structures in South America, actually all over the world. Um, these notches I think are very important. Big tablet right here, big tablet right here. This tablet, again, sitting on these two rocks, very common. And this 18,000 pounder, uh, which weighs as much as four minivans, perched on a piece of rock, mostly underground. So now we're at the end of the hike. Um, you can see the pond. You can see the pond from here. That's the pond. Um, and uh, one side of the wall is over here. The other side is over here. And something very interesting happens that I suspected was going to happen. Uh, the wall actually um, runs underwater. You can see it in here. And on Google Earth, you can see that the wall actually continues on the other side of the pond. So. <laughs> This wall was built before this pond existed, um, unless whoever built it was dropping stones um, into a into a pond. Um, so maybe it would be easier for us to date this pond um, if there's a way to date ponds to get an idea of how old this rock wall was. Um, and just one final piece um, on on this side of the wall, there was another interesting boulder. This kind of curved one right here, again, another piece of granite that you don't find laying in the woods that I think had to have been carved. Um, so that's my tour of the uh, megalithic metropolis with map and some interesting math to go along with it. Clocking in at just under half an hour. Um, I hope you enjoyed, and I think actually this is a good video. If I was to do a presentation or just send an introductory video to these structures and, and, and the mathematics kind of showing uh, what's going on here, this is the one I would show. So I'm, I'm happy I made this. Thanks for watching.